Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome um, to this session on green leadership, uh, where we will be looking for some of that wisdom that David Attenborough recommended to us. Uh, my name is Isabel Hilton. I'm the CEO of China Dialogue. Um, and we publish on many aspects of climate and environment, and many of them that you've just seen there. And it's really very difficult to avoid this sense of multiple crises, not just one crisis. We, we have many interlocking and, and related crises. There's the climate, of course. And the difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees, that report was extremely sobering. Um, particularly when you think that under the Paris Agreement, we are pledged to 3.2, 3.3 degrees at the moment. So we need to um, ratchet up. Uh, we need to bend the emissions curve by 2030. We need to get to net zero by 2050. It's doable, but, but right now we are quite a long way off. And when you add to that the local phenomena, you know, we, we've seen water crises in so many countries uh, recently. Last month, the Indian city of Chennai ran out of water. Before that, it was, it was Cape Town and, and Sao Paulo. And, and these things were next. You know, we, we're, we're, we're seeing them pop up all over the place. Um, we're seeing a steadily increasing number of severe weather events, um, escalating ice melt in Greenland and at the South Pole. We're drowning in our own trash, uh, and we're in the middle of a mass extinction, which will have quite unknown effects on, on the web of life. So it is pretty grim, and it's, it's hard not to sympathize with Greta Thunberg when she said she, when she was in London, she said, um, you know, I don't want reassurance from adults, I want you to panic. <laughs> and so I'm not sure that we actually want to panic, but we certainly want to uh, have a sense of urgency. Um, it, it, we, it really has to... to um, to be now. And I think it's very clear as we look at these young people who, who are on the streets now demanding action that increasingly consumers and investors expect and will increasingly demand that industry and business and enterprise of all shapes face up both to the environmental risk that they, they face and, and to the consumer demand that they become responsible players. And the environmental risk, of course, we've already seen major disruption to supply chains from, from extreme weather events. Um, and we're only at just over one degree of warming. So it could get very much worse. And what this means for business, it seems to me, is that sustainability is no longer that nice paragraph in the annual report, which made everybody feel good. This is, this is no longer an optional extra. This has to be absolutely core business. It has to be a survival strategy, and, 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 and it's become an imperative. So what we are going to talk about today, this afternoon, I'm joined by four people who are grappling with these questions in, in their business and, and in policy areas, and we're going to explore how they're doing it. How do they conceptualize this, this, this challenge? How do they know whether they're doing enough? Um, how do they measure what they're doing? Um, and, and when we've had a conversation amongst ourselves and when we've heard from them, we will also have a conversation with you. So please think about what it is you want to learn out of this session and, and you know, what, what is, bring your questions um, to us. So um, on my uh, immediate left is uh, Liu Shijin, who is the vice chair of the China Development Research Foundation of, of the People's Republic of China. Um, this hosts the China Development Forum, a very uh, high level and important event every, every uh, March. Um, next in line is, is uh, forgive me, is, is Shell, I've forgotten your surname, um, from, from Coca-Cola. And um, uh, we were talking earlier, Shell, Shell Huang Xiaoyan, who is not only a senior executive at Coca-Cola and in charge of, of, of important aspects of sustainability, but is herself a scientist and has played a big role in, in bioplastics, inventing uh, uh, a more friendly uh, uh, materials which have been, which have been used um, in, in Shell. Um, to, to her left is, is Kiel Stark, who's the president 
uh, for China for Danfoss, which is a Danish company involved in many aspects of, uh, of business, but particularly uh, in, in building, in energy efficiency, in cooling, played a major role in the Shanghai Tower, I believe, um, and, and it has played a, a fairly exemplary role in, in exploring the, the whole very difficult question of, of urbanization um, and, and sustainability. And, and last but not least, Bernis Dapa, who's the chief executive officer of Ghana Bamboo Bikes Initiative, by which I long to hear more. Um, uh, this is a, a, an initiative which really is building bamboo bikes, uh, and it's a social enterprise. It's, uh, it, it has an environmental mission too. So I want to, you know, begin um, by asking you, you know, the, the, the kind of fundamental question, given the state of the world. Uh, what, how would you define sustainability, uh, leadership in sustainability? You know, how far, how striking, how ambitious does it have to be to count as leadership? Um, well, perhaps we could start with you. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to say there is uh, one number and one letter you have to remember, and that, that's all uh, what I will give you. 40% of the energy in this world is uh, used in buildings. And 40% of the emission target, according to the Paris Agreement, can be achieved by energy efficiency. Here we are not talking about, uh, in energy we, are, we don't talk about recycling energy, we are talking about recycling plastic, but it's really the same, we can also recycle energy. So 40. 40 And this, the letter I'll uh, ask you to rem remember is the letter C. If we do things right, and if we apply the uh, modern technology, you don't have to sacrifice to live green. You can address the issue with CO2 emission, that's the first C. With cost, that's the second C. And with comfort at the same time. It goes hand in hand if you do uh, things right. And um, that, that, that's uh, really my first point. The second point is we have to be careful that we don't use the word innovation as an excuse for not implementing the current technology. And I see that being done many places. In my own country, Denmark, we have since the energy crisis reduced the, uh, I'm sorry to say now I'm coming with a new number, uh, we have reduced the energy consumption per building square meter with 50%. That is with existing technology and that can be done many places. I can offer technology from my own company that they can cut the heating bill in China with 30% and they can cut the air conditioning bill in all uh, commercial buildings in China with 30%. Okay. The technology is available. Okay, we'll come back to, so uh, that's, to that. That's the imagine. industry commitments to this. <laughs> okay. So, so Shell, you know, Coca-Cola is a company that everybody loves and everybody loves to hate. Uh, it, it's been, you know, it, you can't be that big without being a target. So, so when Coca-Cola claims leadership in this field, what, what does it mean? What does it mean to you? Um, it really means a lot for us. So um, you said exactly right. Coca-Cola is red, Coca-Cola is big, so Coca-Cola is a target. <laughs> Uh, so everybody pay a lot of attention to what Coca-Cola do. I just want to uh, start with uh, t this year, May 8th, we just celebrate our 133 years <coughs> birthday. What, in 1980, uh, no, 1886, um, a, uh, a Dr. John Pemberton in Atlanta, he is a, a, a PhD, oh, you should know Chinese, I forgot. He is a... Well, uh, uh, are shifting to talking to Chinese. Uh, by now, we have established the company for 133 years. And uh, uh, recently, we have seen report that the world top five valued company 
uh, Coca-Cola is among the top five, and the rest of four is related to electronic product. And in the past 103 years, uh, the reason why we are so popular among customers is because we emphasized on sustainable, uh, sustainable development. And uh, for example, you mentioned about a plant bottle. I am very uh, honored to be the inventor of the plant bottle. This probably is my biggest honor in my whole career path. Cyclable, mm. that's a great question. The reason we made uh, and the, the reason why we made it is because it is made of the materials that is 100% recycled. So after we use this bottle, it means from 19, uh, 2009, it means that we have uh, reduced one million vehicles emission. Because Coca-Cola is very big, we generate a substantial impact. And one more thing, the leadership can be reflected recently in that the patent, uh, we have opened the patent to the public in this year, January. And this is a very conscious decision because we believe if something is good for the planet, we should open it to the whole world. All the companies can do it, and it can be applied to a larger scale. It can reduce the cost. It can bring more benefit to us all. So I think this is also a reflection of our leadership. Liu Shijin, China has been through this, you know, these decades of very fast growth. It wasn't always sustainable growth, it wasn't always planet-friendly growth. Um, now we have eco-civilization as, as the you know, ambition. What do you now expect from Chinese companies in the way of sustainability leadership? What, what, from where you sit, what do you see them doing and what do you want them to do? Uh, <coughs> Well, I would like to take another perspective and another colleague of mine is uh, the uh, chief consultant uh, from the major think tank in China, emphasize on the environmental protection and the green development. And Recently, we have been talking about how to work on the leadership of green development. And we have reached the new consensus, which emphasize on three points. First of all, the green development has included, but not limited, to the environmental protection and uh, treatment of pollution. It should also include green consumption, green production, green logistics, green innovation, and green finance. And it is actually a whole economic ecosystem that is green. And the second point is that the green development is not a, a remedy for the traditional industrial development. It should also be something that go in parallel with the traditional industrial development. And this should be a new development pattern to go forward. Therefore, we need to do our calculation right, because the traditional development way have produced a lot of cost that we haven't been able to put into the calculation. However, the new type of development, the green development, also has some cost that we haven't involved in the calculation. So what we need to do is to involve the traditional cost and the green cost, and we make the comparison of the two. And then we can discover that the green development pattern 
would be more economic competitive. And the third point is that based on the previous two points, previously we have put the green development to the opposite side of economic improvement because people might worry about that the green development would be a barrier for future economic growth because sometimes we do need to put something down or sacrifice some growth point. However, if we take another point, we know that the green development is not only just taking something away, we are adding something more. For example, the green consumption, the green logistics, and so on. And not only we do minus and adding, we also do multiplying, because the green innovation will give us a great momentum for economic growth. And therefore, next, what will be China's next economic driver? It will be dependent on the green development. I think uh, greenness will be driving China's economy in the future. That, and so then, then it's two of our speakers who've, who've emphasized that this is not about sacrifice, but, but there's also a large opportunity piece. Um, Bernice, you, you, you started off with this, with this opportunity. Um, you, know, you, you set up a company which was, from its beginning, had, had ambitions to be, to be green, to be sustainable. Yeah. Could, could you just tell us a bit more about its origins and what, or what the ambitions are? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think the origin on, or the idea of we coming up with Bamboo Bicycle is to come up with a project that can tackle the environment, the social and the economic aspects. Um, as you can see in recent times, commuters have been more concerned about traffic congestion and um, how to reduce carbon emissions. Bicycle users are uh, more, I mean, uh, focusing on uh, uh, green, I mean, models, low carbon and lean energy efficiency. So we have decided to take upon ourselves to use the local raw materials we found in Ghana, which is bamboo. Um, to produce bamboo bicycles. So we get this bamboo from our sustained, I mean, uh, managed bamboo raw materials for production, which is very green. Um, we like the idea of reusing the bicycles because reusing the bamboo, because bamboo is found in abundance in Ghana and it's the one of the fast growing, I mean, grass in the world. Um, we not just harvesting the bamboos, but we are also cultivating bamboo to offset carbon in our country. So I could see one of the initiatives that we are trying to see how best we can use to mitigate climate change. And, and how, uh, how you, you, are these mainly sold in Ghana? Are you, are you, where have we got to with the enterprise? Can you come again? Forgive me, the, the, the bicycles? Yeah. Uh, what is the market for the bicycles? Oh, the market for the bamboo bicycle is um, very huge now. Currently, we are producing in, in a large quantity in Ghana. Um, local people are patronizing. We've started exporting in a small quantity, which we are hoping for the subsequent years, we're going to export in a large quantity. Great. So we've, we've talked about um, individually what, what the companies are doing. This session is about leadership. We opened with a, a, a panorama of crisis, if you like. And, and so what I'd like to get a sense of from you is how do you measure what you are doing against the, 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 the scale of the crisis, if you like? Where do you see your company and your company's actions fitting in against what's required? For instance, in peaking the emissions curve by by 2030, or in getting to net uh, to, to net neutrality by 2050, are those the measures that you use, and and how do you uh, how do you report against them? So, Shell, you're nodding. Yeah, I like to start. <laughs> That's a really good question, especially as a huge company as we are. We need to measure, and we need to have a goal. So uh, recently, uh, our CEO, James Quincy, uh, announced that our uh, packaging sustainability goal, that is by 2025, um, all our packaging materials will be 100% recyclable. That's in packaging material design part. 
but by year 2030, we will recycle and reuse 100% equivalent materials for whole company globally that we use. And also 50% of that material used globally in our packaging will from recycled and reused material. So that is really clear goal for the whole company. And we are measuring as we are go, go, uh, uh, make the effort towards that. And we are very confident because we did a similar um, goal uh, about 10 years ago. In 2007, we made the same similar goal of 100% uh, water replenish Shui Hui Kui by year 2020, but we achieved five years ahead by 2015. Well, I'm going to challenge you on that yes. because um, Greenpeace and, and various other entities were very critical of the way you measured that. Um, for example, the, the, you know, you, the, I think the goal was to return 100% of the water that you, that you used, Correct. but you're only counting the water in the bottle, not all, the much larger quantity of water that went to no, no, you no. Know, producing what was in the bottle. We, the, the exactly measure is for using the water to make the beverage. We even count the water wash our, our bottles, wash our line, or every drop is counted, and we are as you said, Coca-Cola is a big company. We are under micro, microscope for everything we do. We have internal uh, audit more stringent than external audit. Audit everything we right. do. A but after I joined Coca-Cola, I know there are so many lawyers internally. Anyway, I probably would, shouldn't would that say include, that. Well, would that include the sugar, the, you know, the, the, the inputs which go into you know, what you make? They have a very big footprint. Exactly. That's why we are very, very... Um, pay the, our full uh, attention, pay our, we pay very great attention to measuring what we do. So now we have this goal, we are, now it's getting, we call it the bill of materials from every department, from every country, from every BU business units, what they are using, what are re recyclable or not. Unbelievable detail because we know what we do will be looked under a microscope. And we are not doing this just for doing this. We are really, we need to do this. As we said, as a, such a big company, we have to be uh, looking at the, what, another 133 years, right? That's the only way. Sure. And uh, uh, Mr. Liu said really well that it's not against each other. It's actually helping each other. When, sure. we, when we have, you know, recycled bottle, we have plant bottle, consumer prefer those. So we, we think it's really helping our business. It's not against our business. So we have internal drive to do this. Right. And, and do you think that there is a legacy of, of uh, you, you talked about, yes, you get a lot of scrutiny. You get a lot of scrutiny because 3,500 bottles a second, roughly, of your, are consumed. So of course you get a lot of scrutiny. I mean, do you feel that people, that you have to trust, uh, that, that your consumers trust you to be doing the right thing or be doing need what you say you're doing? We need to continue uh, educate and communicate with our consumer. These are not waste. These are valuable materials right. for other use. Today, I wear these shoes, 100% made from recycled bottles. These from startup company in uh, San Francisco. They only make uh, products with 100% recycled material from bottles. And then my shirt is 100%. <laughs> <laughs> and this bag, 24 bottles, 24 bottles made this bag, you can buy on Taobao. Um, <laughs> so, so you're walking the talk. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, so th these are very valuable. I'm a polymer scientist, mm -hmm. right? So this is most recycled material. I want to use this opportunity to let people know this is most recyclable, most valuable material of, of among all plastics because you can rebuild the molecular weight during the right. recycling. So please, these are gold, these can make our carpets and our clothing, our shoes, everything, our bags. So <laughs> if we do recycle everything we produce and we can make the world green. Great. Well, you also talked about the opportunity side and the, um, and the energy savings and the efficiencies. Um, you're a, a Danish company operating in China. Are you seen as an expensive option? Um, I mean, because, you know, for, for what you do to work, you also have to have buy-in from, from all the stakeholders. So, 
the client needs to want it, it needs to be valued. Is that an obstacle? The, um, it's uh, highly relevant because uh, talking about uh, energy efficiency, it's like observing an uh, iceberg. You can uh, choose to just focus on uh, the chip is that are above the water, and that is the upfront cost. Or you can look at the entire iceberg and include the, uh, the life cycle cost. Um, one of the obstacles we, um, we have here in China is that uh, many, uh, especially purchasing departments, they just look at the chip above the iceberg and are not concerned about the other uh, things because that's in another department and, and, and. And we can also see it between companies. Uh, there is uh, one set of organization that built buildings and there are another set that get the benefit of a uh, high efficient building and get the savings there. And that is not completely figured out uh, how that should uh, work because otherwise the development would be more f faster than it is. Sure. And, and we really, we know that from EU, we know it from US, we really need legislation to support that process. <coughs> it ought not to be possible to build a new building in China with one layer glass. First of all, if you take an apartment, I, I live in Shanghai. First of all, if you buy an apartment in Shanghai, it costs 20 million uh, RMB, so the glass cost is insignificant. It doesn't really matter. But it matters to the energy consumption. Absolutely. And that can only be solved. And, and for the builder, for the one who building the, uh, the building, he would like to get at the lowest cost possible. He's not concerned about the uh, energy consumption because he's not going to get the benefit. And it's only really legislation that can uh, solve that issue. Right. I, I, it's a while since I looked at it, but at one point, the average life of a new building in a Chinese city was 20 years, uh, which is clearly crazy. Uh, the, the turnover was just so fast. Yeah, and and the, positive, the positive spin on that is... If we change legislation, it can relatively uh, quickly have an impact. Right. So, so Mr. Liu, that's, I think, a question for you. Um, you know, we, we, we hear that you can still build buildings in China which don't meet energy efficiency standards in, in, in any way. Why, why is that? And can we expect that to change? Uh, well, this is also a question I have been thinking about because in China, I also see there are many existing good technologies that can be readily applied and achieve immediate results, but they are not applied. Uh, of course, it also includes some um, monetary standardization and also legislation efforts to be taken, which I believe is uh, very necessary for China in the future. A separate point I want to raise is that uh, I just introduced that uh, I also wear a separate hat at, as an advisor to China's uh, Committee of International Cooperation for uh, Economy and Development, uh, for Environment and Development. At uh, CCICED, we are discussing uh, about the possibility of whether we can apply, for example, 10 measures or green technologies that can be rolled out across China. So this is an ongoing research we are doing at the Committee of uh, International Cooperation for Environment and Development. So I'm making a call to the audience to uh, come and join us if you have such technologies. We welcome your participation because it's critical for China to achieve green development. We for example, it, you know, that's not an unusual technology anymore. Why, why would that not be mandatory in a new building? Uh, uh, indeed, this is the challenge we encounter. Uh, this challenge is not unique to China. I see similar challenges in other markets. Something simple that 
could have been done and should have been done many years ago, but are not being done. But uh, we, we must change that. Uh, I want to emphasize the point that uh, there are many new technologies that are emerging in recent years. And uh, innovation today means inherently green technology. That's how strong people's awareness has become. So we have an expectation for greenness, uh, for new innovations. Everything we do, every technology we develop, we have to pay attention to its environmental impact. There are some uh, simple technologies, but also many cutting edge technologies. And uh, we should encourage these efforts and also the commercialization, the market application of these technologies. We can do it through monetary legislation, of course, but also to educate the public, to encourage the consumption and usage of uh, these technologies. For example, I know that there are some ready-to-apply cooling technologies that can be used on buildings, but uh, the low awareness is really hampering its application. So one, on one hand, we should encourage innovation. On the other hand, we need to educate the public to make people aware of those technologies. And for those we need to legislate, we will also have to make efforts on the legal front. So it all boils down to leadership. Of course, this is not unique to China, but you know, like Coca-Cola, China is very big. <laughs> and so whatever it does, it has a big impact and it gets scrutinized. Can I add something? Uh, I also want to echo the point of uh, uh, glass, because uh, glass production is also a very energy intensive sector. And that is why Coca-Cola is uh, shifting from glass bottles to plastic bottles. Because if you look at the life cycle of glass bottles, you definitely should go for uh, plastic and uh, recyclable plastic, which is uh, which has the minimum environmental footprint. So for Coca-Cola as a big company, we must do things that are fundamentally right. Otherwise, uh, people will put us under scrutiny and uh, they will always find faults with us. So this is the current focus on plastic. And uh, I will recommend uh, the plant bottle to Dr. Liu after the session. Leadership. Um, clearly, what the, what the material is is important. The recyclability is important. That doesn't necessarily mean it gets recycled. As part of your claim to leadership, do you also plan or have you put in, in place systems which you know, guarantee that there is recyclability, like collection points? Great question. Thing? Great question. Uh, actually, Chinese government very recently launched a campaign for garbage separation uh, reform. This is a very good move because once that policy is in place, the plastic bottles will be separated from the rest of the, cash, uh, the, the trash. Also, uh, during last year's uh, annual meeting of the new champions, we introduced our very first vending recycling combined machine. So on the left hand side is a regular, regular vending machine. On the right hand side of the same machine, you got a recycling uh, uh, machine. And uh, if you put the empty bottle inside the machine, you will get a credit uh, or a reward. And if you accumulate enough credits, you will get a handbag from recycled plastic in return as a reward. So this is the incentive we are trying to push to uh, encourage broader participation. OK, can I also add on the point of uh, garbage separation? There has been many discussions. Uh, earlier, we heard about uh, uh, monetary administrative measures or legislation. Also, uh, reward is uh, very effective in uh, encouraging uh, broader-based participation because garbage separation should be regarded as a lifestyle. If we do it for long enough, our children 
will regard garbage separation as a natural part of their day-to-day -day life, and it will be bizarre and strange not to separate garbage in the future. So by then, there is no need for monetary policy or legislation because uh, everybody has, uh, grow, has grown accustomed to this new habit. Um, consumer yeah. interface, I can see that working, but, but you know, Geld has a different problem. He has a problem where a builder wants to build something for the lowest cost, not to the highest standards, and he's looking for public policy support, and, and I'm not sure that you're quite getting it yet. Um, but as then as a company, um, do you go ahead anyway? Do you insist on those standards? What do you do when there isn't that policy framework to support your innovation and your leadership? Of course, we, um, <laughs> we don't, uh, we move on. Um, and uh, some are receptive and can sell it as uh, green buildings. That is also being uh, more and more fashionable. Um, so there's a kind of brand advantage uh, to the builder? It, it, it is not uh, black and white. But have you, what, what would you say are your biggest obstacles to, to building to the kind of standards or, or innovating to the level that you'd like to? I would say um, this thing about looking at upfront cost. Right. It's the short term. Opposed to life cycle cost. Right. That, that, is, that is preventing that things can move as fast as we would like it to. A little bit higher up. We also have the issue of uh, education. The more advanced product you use, the more the need is for service. We have a good example in, um, it's a little bit special, but uh, I would like to mention it anyway. In cold rooms, in the, um, when you uh, buy uh, your food over the internet, then uh, they will be stored in a big uh, cold room. Uh, they use, uh, and uh, the technology there is called industrial refrigeration, and uh, the typical refrigerant there is ammonia. Ammonia is uh, very Im environmentally friendly, but uh, if it leaks, then it can kill you. And uh, there have been some accidents in China which has been very unfortunate that uh, up to several hundred people have uh, died in an ammonia accident. Uh, and that makes some, even on government level, say uh, ammonia is too dangerous. So uh, we should start to use freon. And I hope everybody knows in this room that freon is the absolute worst uh, uh, refrigerant that you can use because it's also depleting the ozone layer and all the, uh, kind of other stuff. But nevertheless, Freon is on the way up. And there we have taken the, uh, together with the Chinese uh, Refrigeration Association, uh, on to re educate the industry. We have never in uh, Denmark or I would almost say Europe had a uh, fatal accident with ammonia because we have a very solid education. Then you come back to, you can ask the question, is it dangerous to use an elevator? No, it's not really dangerous to use an elevator because there is strict rules for right. the maintenance so, and service. So it's how it's done, not that it's done. And, but, and, yeah. and if we could apply that same mindset, we could yeah. uh, face out Freyan, which should have been faced out many years ago. Yeah and use an environmentally friendly uh, uh, So I would say, uh, now I'm living in Shanghai, I'm the China president, so China feels a lot in, uh, in my head. Uh, education, uh, uh, basic education, that is important because we will also in the future have more and more uh, sophisticated products. And, and that will demand more responsible and, and, action. And Can I, I, yep. I just want to, um, to go to Bernice, because uh, we've heard about a number of, of, of things here, whether there's brand advantage in being uh, a conspicuously sustainable, you know, whether there's public support for leadership, 
uh, what, what, what we've learned from this experience. And, and I just, you know, from where you sit in, in Ghana, how much, how much interest, how much public support and how much policy support is there for the kind of initiative that you're taking? Okay. Currently in Ghana, I think we are getting um, a lot of public support from especially um, from our government through the Ministry of um, Environment which they are actually helping us to see how best we can cultivate more bamboos to um, conserve our forests and also reduce um, emissions. Aside from that, we are also developing our own policy or our programs to I mean, leverage on our production. Currently, we're trying to see how best the waste, of, um, through the waste we produce through the bamboo bicycle production we're able to see how best we can use it for briquettes, which is clean energy, as another source of um, alternative livelihood or economic empowerment for the youth in our country. So basically, that is what we are doing, and we are also encouraging farmers <coughs> not to underutilize bamboo, especially when they harvest the bamboo, they shouldn't throw the surplus away, which is, they are mostly, they are being considered them as a waste, but we are going to make a very good, uh, efficient use of those wastes to produce pellets and uh, briquettes, which is still under piloting. Right. So you continue to innovate around the, sure, the, the, sure. the, the, uh, the uh, supply chain. Great, so ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to hear from you. Um, there will be a microphone if you can just indicate if you have questions. Don't be shy. <laughs> and this gentleman there and one there. Do we have a roving mic, please? I can't see. The, the gentleman there? Uh, okay. Well, yes, hello. Next so time. You, you've all talked about. <laughs> please uh, tell us who you are, sir. Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> my name's Ed Nigerian, and I'm part of the uh, Young Global Leaders Group. Um, I've heard a lot about what you're doing in your o at your own companies. Um, how uh, do you think is the best way to go about taking a leadership position in terms of forcing other companies um, that might not be adopting green policies to, 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 to literally force them to adopt? Uh, because it's great that Coke is doing what it's doing, uh, but we need so much more and so much more buy-in from all of the private sector and the public sector across the globe. So I feel like leadership needs to go beyond our own entities, but needs to move, you know, needs to sort of force the non-adopters to adopt. Great question. How do we do that? <laughs> okay, great. And could we take another question here, please? Just, just. Uh, I'm from Zhejiang Daily. I have a question for Coca-Cola. Uh, a friend of mine uh, being attended the uh, G20 summit just a few days ago, and uh, they've already seen the recycling uh, plastic bottle from Coca-Cola. And uh, he said that to produce a new bottle, if you compare it with uh, recycling, that will have lower cost, lower cost for new production. So why Coca-Cola, you are still using recycling materials in Japan, but not in China? Is that a cost consideration? And another thing about my research in Africa, I've noticed that some of the uh, small shops in uh, Africa use uh, glass bottles for Coca-Cola, and why is that? Uh, so to answer your first question, uh, I'm very happy that Professor Liu is here to help me. Well, in China, we haven't using the recycling materials to produce bottles is because we haven't received the government approval. Uh, one of the reason, one of the reasons is that it's not all the companies can accom uh, can accommodate for this standard. Because globally, Coca-Cola will have 100% uh, uh, bottle recycling in some of the countries. 
and uh, some of the other countries can achieve part of uh, our bottles recycled. For example, in Japan, in US, and in Europe countries, and these have not been approved by Chinese government. And this is also the leadership that you mentioned, and we have been working on it. However, China has its own characteristics. And in China, we are a developing country. We have a lot of uh, other products like uh, clothing, like um, carpet and so on. These are all made by polyester. So I'm not saying that the polyesters in China has nowhere to go. Like some reports said, uh, these have been uh, discharged into the sea freely. Because if I'm walking on the street holding an empty bottle, some of the people might ask me if you can give me the bottle for free. So I do believe that the bottle in China has been recycled. But maybe in the future five years or 10 years, there would be recycling in China as well. And the second question, uh, as for the glass bottles, because in Africa, those glass bottles are refillable because we haven't made any investment of plastic bottles in Africa. But as I said, the glass bottle is not really having less economic potential to the environment because of the high temperature in production and also the cleaning. Adopt your standards. Um, is that this is an interesting question about how, how do we address the laggards. But the laggards, they have never been the leaders. Our, my dream scenario, that is that uh, Xi Jinping, he says that uh, we need to have uh, energy reduction here in China. I want to cut it with 50%. Please, industry, line up with your proposals for how we could cut energy consumption with 50%. It's more for less. I want the same performance, but uh, less, uh, 50 percent less energy. I want it for cars. I want it in buildings. I want it in trains and airplanes and blah blah blah. Uh, that will be uh, the time where the the winner stands out, uh, and uh, th this is something to build on. So I feel a little bit more aggressive towards the high ideals, because I'm sure the industry can deliver. Not the laggards, but the winners, they can. And I think that this is what we should somehow increase the award for being good, rather than wait until everybody else comes up there so we can start to compete against each other. That's how progress is made in this world. But that's interesting because uh, you often see a pattern of, of, of legislation being proposed or regulation being proposed and industry resisting it. But you're actually saying legislation and, re and, and uh, has not gone far enough, that, that you want mandatory. We, we could go much further. Right. Much further. So uh, all, all over the world. Um, I wonder if China's ready to do this. <laughs> Mr. Liu. <laughs> you, there's been a challenge. Uh, I know you're not Mr. Xi Jinping, but um, there was a challenge to, to Mr. Xi Jinping to mandate a 50% cut in China's energy use. Uh, uh, yes, I, I just wondered whether you thought that was an, a, a plausible leadership move on China's part. It might help China's industry to become leaders also. Well, in the recent years, the energy efficiency in China has been improved fairly fast, and uh, we've got statistics for that. And just now, we've got a question that how can we involve more companies to join this green footstep? We know not all the companies are doing it green greenly, and uh, Therefore, we need to emphasize on the concept. This green concept has gaining its popularity in China. If you want to become a company or an individual who receive a high recognition, high reputation, green is the way that you need to go. 
And the second thing is we need to have a regulation framework and legal framework. And thirdly, financing is also very important. Uh, just shortly ago, we've got a seminar on green financing. In China, we have ranked number one in the world as for the green financing development. So we were talking about how big it will be in 10 years. And we're saying 10 years ago, if you're not still doing something not green enough, well, if we change another word, ten, in 10 years' time, all the things will be green. So for a company, if you don't do your business in a green way, it is impossible for you to guide financing. And that is the way for the future, for the future company. Does anyone have a quick question for the panel? <laughs> Lots of people, gentlemen here in the front. Could we, could, but I'm afraid it's the last one. You'll have to novel them afterwards. I've got a question for Mr. Liu. Um, for the green financing, uh, what would be the role for the monetary tool to play? Is that too much loosening policy is not good? Uh, monetary policy is a micro policy. Uh, is a, a tightened policy or loosened policy? It would be a decision based on the microeconomic development. But for green development, it is a pattern of choice. I don't think that the green economic would go together with a tightened monetary policy. If we have a normal economic development, we will see bigger and bigger share goes to green economy. And therefore, the thing lies in how do we increase the proportion of green economy, which involve many topic. For example, how can we do the right calculation for the cost of green economy development? But in general, I think we've got a common target that is the proportion of green economy will increase in the long run. We can uh, finish with some good stories about what is going on in China. Right now, you are in Liaoning province, for those of you who should not know it. One of the neighbor cities here, Benchi, we have been engaged in a project with, uh, we are talking about a three years payback time, not very long. There was simply about, there is a steel plant there using the surplus heat from the water. There's an enormous uh, amount of water produced in the steel plant. Instead of letting it out in the river, then use it for district heating in the city. It's a fantastic story, short payback time, and there are many other similar projects waiting. So technology is there, the potential is there, and I think also uh, it should be uh, possible to find the funding. The sh payback time are very short, and that will help on the CO2. You will get uh, almost free uh, water, uh, free, uh, dish, uh, free heating, Thank and it will give a much better comfort for the, uh, the citizen in Vinci. That's really good to have a, a good story. Uh, you don't win by being pessimistic, as a colleague of mine said the other day, um, and it, it's a bit of a challenge sometimes given everything we face. You, you're all involved in this. I think we all know that you know, we're still not quite there, um, but I would like to thank you for what you have done to date. If there's one thing you've learned that you want to share, just, just one really quick thing, is there something you would like to add at this point, yeah. Bernice? Yeah. I think um, 
something I would want to share is um, we're all talking about green business in terms of sustainability in our leadership perspective. I believe for, as a business, we need to be very competitive and um, so, so that our customers can be more, take our products very bearable and um, assurance of our product. For instance, with our bamboo bike, we are taking advantage of the current trend of the e-bikes, trying to go into bamboo, uh, bamboo e-bikes, which we have um, successfully been piloting our um, bamboo e-bikes, which is going to be solar powered. So I think with this, I mean, current trend, we should be very innovative in um, our various, I mean, industry, so that we can be more competitive in our operations. Fantastic. Yeah. Shell, is there one last thought you want to yeah, share? I'm very that pleased. <laughs> no, I'm very pleased to hear that the China government has re-emphasized the importance of uh, the green development going forward. It's not just lip service, it's really a path that the country wants to follow. Shell. Thank you. Very quickly. Uh, if one thing I feel is the leadership, as you keep asking and also audience ask that question, Coca-Cola as a big corporation, we do a lot for ourselves with clear goals, with clear initiatives, the first one to do plant bottle, first one to ban PVC label, first one to ban Freon for our refrigerators. But how we play that leadership to influence and lead the whole society, other companies, everybody towards the same goal. I think the leadership is what I really So that's your me. next challenge, and uh, we look forward to seeing how you resolve it. Meanwhile, thank you all very much indeed, and thank you for being here.